Welcome to Break Free and Thrive. Today, my guest is Lita Green, and Lita Green is an international author, speaker. Uh, she speaks on, and trains internationally in the beauty industry. In addition to, she helps entrepreneurs start their businesses, and she is a wealth of information, and I am so grateful, Lita, that you are joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Karen. I'm excited to be on, not only because it's just fun to be on podcasts and I love doing them, but you're my friend. So even, even more fun. Yes. Well, and when you and I connected, we actually were talking about your first bestseller. And I do have to say, it really connected with my heart only because it was talking about hotness from a, from a really personal level. You know, we all have these images that we want everyone else to see us in. And yet, when I read this book, it really, it really got to my heart. And the reason it got to my heart was because in order for people to connect, we have to connect authentically. And it doesn't matter what's on our face, regardless if you're in the beauty industry or not. So what I wanted to ask was, how did you become such a hot bestseller on this journey? Well, um, first of all, I think a lot of people, you know, we have our story, right? And so when people are like, oh, how did you write the book? And it's more than just the story, but pulling the lessons out. Yeah. And I do think that's been one of my gifts in life is that I'm able to, even while I'm in the middle of something, kind of be like, what's the lesson? What's the lesson? And so the, the book is about me going from being told that I was ugly and that nobody would love me. And, you know, like every woman looking at the images of magazines and going, I don't match up to this. And I am a normal woman. I am a size 10, 12 if I work at it. And, you know, I have the, the extra chin and the extra love and a little wiggle under my arms. I'm a normal woman. And um, as a 13 year old, I looked kind of like I look now just with a little bit less love around the middle. Right. <laughs> so I, you know, I could look at those magazines and go, I don't fit. And then I would compare myself to my blonde petite sister that was closer to the ideal, but still even the ideal is Photoshopped. Right. And I've had a professional uh, sit down, you know, uh, photo shoot to get pictures mm -hmm. and they can shave 20 pounds off just by how they angle your body. Right? Well, and that's one of the things that I think is really interesting. Having been in the beauty industry for 19 plus years, you've 26. seen 26. Oh my goodness. My first paid, you know, my first paid makeover to, to now at 45. And, you know, I, I got into it with just like a lot of women do, get into makeup for their every day. Mm -hmm. I got into it to cover up my scars and I am very good at makeup. I'm very good at art. And so it's, it was a way for me to make a living and I got to connect with people. So it was awesome. But I noticed that a lot of my clients had the same Im image of themselves that I had had. Mm -hmm. And so I started sharing with them things that I had done lessons and they'd come back and they'd say, no, your makeup was great, but better was what you taught me. And so after years and years of hearing that, um, you know, it's just the whisperings of God maybe a little bit of slamming on the top of the head from God that I would <laughs> write a book. And my first book took me two and a half years to write at the end of doing makeovers all day and being a mom and a wife. And I'd go up into the office and shut the door and I would write out what I'd written on napkins throughout the day. I was like, Oh yeah, that is a really good thing that I say a lot. I should write that down. Um, so it took me a while. I'm not like going to turn out a book every year because I really try to put amazing content and value in front of people in a relatable way. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm so proud of it and thrilled that in its fourth year, Barnes and Noble picked it up, which was like, I'm a legit author. <laughs> I've never read that. The cubicle liked it. And so, you know, it's at Barnes and Noble. And um, it, I hadn't really been selling on Amazon that much, um, mostly just um, through my speaking and people who knew me. Um, it became a bestseller. It's done over 10,000 copies. So. Well, and let's focus on that just a moment, because as a person that's in the beauty industry, when I first came to your home office, I was amazed at all of these um, ribbons that were hanging, and we see some that are in the, the back view, um, and I was just like, this woman is kind of like a beauty queen, 
she's been like all over the place. She's got her crown. She has her diamonds. She has her, you know, whatever. And I was just like, I don't believe this woman. Yeah, but because you met me and you realize I'm just normal, like we all are, <laughs> right? And, you know, what else do you do with your plaques and sashes? sashes? Now, just for clarification, those are not literally beauty queen sashes. They are... <laughs> Then, um, so I started in beauty when I was 18, but, you know, actually younger when the girls were sneaking to school and putting makeup, but nobody was paying me for that until I was about 18. But um, in 2001, I joined after I was a makeup wedding artist, wedding makeup artist. Sorry, I said that with weird grammar. Um, I was, um, I found Synagens International and I have been in their top leadership and they give us crowns and sashes and awards. And I have done quite well, and they have given me a lot of them to wear. It is a little bit, maybe too much that I, <laughs> that I earned of. So, right? I got to, you know, I'm like, you know. <laughs> but but, but the, the real um, pr truth there is, in spite of the fact that you have been in this industry, you've been able to take it to a higher level. You've been able to train people that are in that that business so that they are can improve their entrepreneurial skills as well you've traveled around not just the country but around the globe training people and i'm sure there are images that you've seen of people or women in the u.s and you've kind of compared that to or not necessarily compared but you've seen similar images outside of the US and I think that is one of the things that we always think it's always you know just what's in our backyard and the truth of the matter is what you've been seeing has been a global effect well it was interesting when I went to Armenia um, uh, ironically the Kardashians are part Armenian okay so they're very well known and if you look at what the Kardashians depict an American woman's life to be one of the things that I had to clarify with them is, no, I do not have a man on the side. Um, I, I, ha I don't, I mean, I happen to have a maid, but I've been a maid, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. so, and currently I don't because I have teenagers. So, you know, <laughs> when my kids were little, yeah, I had a maid. So when I was in Armenia, I had, I had a maid, but that is not the normal American thing. So I just was kind of like, well, not only do I not have like a third class person in my life, right? I've been mm -hmm. that person. So we would never look at that person as, you know, I grew up very blue collar, but I had to explain that I do my own grocery shopping. I do my own childcare. Uh, another funny thing, when I went to Indonesia, all women there that are of the more elite class have these huge elaborate nails. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that you're, you're all seeing me on a normal office day. I've got the messy bun, you know, I've got my t-shirt, I'm comfortable, right? Jeans, whatever. But this is me on a normal day, no fingernail polish. And I, because I was there to speak, I had actually gone the extra mile and put fingernail polish on. <laughs> and they, there was a big conversation and they were tapping my fingers and I'm fluent in sign language, so I understand body language. And there was a big problem with my nails. And they were way too gracious, but I figured out what it was. I am there as their speaker and trainer with working class hands. Mm. And so they said, you want to get your nails done? And I was like, well, no, I don't really want to damage my acrylic. And I was like, yes, yes, I do. And I had nails that are, you know, they, they were three dimensional they yeah. had all over that. I was like, I don't even know what I'm going to do with these when I go home and, you know, clean my, do my dishes, but they're very tool like, but anyway, it is just funny that how we look at how American women and our American beauty ideal, there are differences, but sadly, our idea of perfection is tainting a lot of amazing perspectives on beauty mm -hmm. and plastic surgery and things like that. These are sadly an American thing and they are spreading all over into societies that um, we, we've kind of tainted the world with our idea of what womanhood is. Right. And they have a lot to teach us about family mm -hmm. and how to take care of family. Mm -hmm. And yet they look at us and think, we're supposed to, you know, be shopping and, you know, having gossip and whatever TV says we are supposed to be. And I'm like, no, that's only like 2% of us. So do you have any statistics that kind of share when did this, I'm going to say migration go from what the image of a woman was to all of this 
you know, Botox and plastic surgery. Has that been going on for the past 15 exactly. years? No, it's been longer than that. Oh. Um, yeah, it's been probably about the 60s is when America really was um, permeating other cultures. But as much as the 80s, they still had as far as a body ideal. Um, like Latin America's body ideal in the 80s was a very full-figured hourglass, right? So mm -hmm. larger chest, could have larger shoulders, smaller waist, but big hips. Okay, so Marilyn Monroe, who, by the way, is a size 16. Oh. Okay, so that, that, that would be the ideal sexy woman in a Latin American culture to today, it is 100% in line with what Hollywood says. Okay. Which is larger breasts, but no hips. <laughs> you know what I mean? Very, yeah. very slender and, mm -hmm. um, you know, not as common to happen naturally, if you know what I'm saying. Yes, so, absolutely. Um, I was hot. I would have been hot when I was growing up in Latin America if I'd grown up in Latin America. So, you know. In, in Thank America. goodness, because we would have never met had that happened. Well, no, I would have had a better accent. So oh. that, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it's interesting to see that now the body image ideal of what young girls are growing up with has even permeated into some Middle Eastern countries, which mm. are typically very cut off from our media. But um, that, that's, that's like almost a whole entire other podcast that's pretty interesting to those of us who like looking at impact and social impact that it's not a healthy thing. And I love that I think social media could help us get into some of these countries and help people realize how real we are. And I feel like that's something I've been able to do. Mm -hmm. They're my friends and that have connected. I have a large following in these different countries that I've been in and they're getting to see what a normal American woman. Now we all know I'm probably not terribly normal, but through <laughs> shopping and uh, you know, I, I clean and I'm not always perfect you know, like I am when I'm on those trips, you know, I have every outfit's been figured out. I mean, you know what I mean? So even yeah. I'm perpetuating it. So I love that like, social media gives me the ability to say, no, this is normal. Okay. And I have, I'm with my kids. I don't have a nanny. <laughs> right. So one of the other things I wanted to ask about was, because to me, it seems we tend to wear makeup to kind of cover up more that we don't want people to see. So we kind of are wearing a mask. And I know I've noticed this more so that there are some women that can't leave the house unless they have, you know, perfect outfit, full, you know, makeup and nails and all of that done. And it kind of reminds me of some of the things that we did longer years ago when it was just, you know, putting a woman you without makeup exactly yeah. exactly so I, can you an early riser i have to get up at 4 a.m to beat him <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely i mean you know from my first book that i am kind of saying let's turn these beauty ideas on their head now i put makeup on this morning because that's what i chose to do and i got ready for me today now i do like anyone else if i were to go and do a speech or go to a job that has a certain level of grooming, I could not show up in jeans and t-shirt like I'm wearing today to my job. Right. Um, and most people can't. So the level of care and grooming we put into ourselves does indicate to the world that I knew today was coming. But uh, today I put makeup on because I wanted to, and I could have done this podcast without makeup. That probably would have been okay as well. Right. Maybe Absolutely. not professional, but you know, being you and we're friends, it would have been a funny thing we could have talked about, but it's best that I look like I know how to do my own makeup, you know, but if you're outside the beauty industry, you really just need to look at this idea of what is the amount of grooming that you need to do, not that you should do, right? There's mm -hmm, a difference between mm -hmm. need and should, because should connotates shame and guilt, right? And need is just, this is the level and this is what I'm willing to do. And I don't have to do more and that's okay. And for most women, that's a little bit of, um, you know, it just kind of depends. That's what I do with makeup artists. Some women need a little bit of rouge. Some women need a little bit of eyeshadow. Sometimes just lipstick will finish you off and a little bit of mascara. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a lot to say I meant for today to happen. It depends on your face shape, what those things are. But I'm a really big fan of using makeup and clothing 
as a time that I'm no longer shaming myself, that I'm no longer putting in the should category, I have to show up this way, I should be doing this, but instead to take that time to do something that I call vanity prayers. And you can read my book to discover the story of how I did this, but basically it's an affirmation exercise that I discovered when I was 15. Okay. And not because my family were like little gurus and yogis, but because my dad was a trucker. So there were no like, let's do affirmations, you know, <laughs> something that was given to me and it made sense. And I did it. It connected with my soul. And I know that it came from God, but I, and I had to practice a new way of thinking of myself. And okay. typically my self-talk, like most of us, was the self-talk that had been role modeled to me by the women and, you know, in, in my family and literally what had been said to me, which were what I call really some poopy things. Grandma should not have told me that I was ugly and that nobody would love me. Hmm. That was not an appropriate thing for a grandmother to say. And I would think most grandmas don't say that kind of thing to our kids. Um, but it really, as I got older, I realized that was just a reflection of how she referred to herself. She believed there was a standard of beauty and she, to the eating disorder level, worked to maintain that. And her poor little granddaughter was just so far out of what was possible. How could I ever have? And so really it was an expression of love from her because she was trying to help me lower my expectations. Oh, but if you, if you kind of look at it yeah. from that perspective, she really was trying to be kind to me. Mm -hmm. But what it led to, of course, was a lot of, you know, shame and self-talk that was very toxic for me. Mm -hmm. And at a certain age, we become <clears throat> about it, how we frame ourselves and vanity prayers are when I go in the bathroom I don't say anything in there that I would not say to a child okay so I do not say oh I'm fat oh look at my chin I can't believe my chin oh look at the wrinkles I go in there and I'm like dang lady you got it you are amazing <laughs> and so I say spend enough time on yourself in the morning to forget about yourself the rest of the day because women were going to anyway so we might as well be taking care of our mindset our <clears throat> Heart. And so I saw me being awesome today when I was brushing my teeth. I was look, I looked at my schedule and I was like, oh, no one's going to see my bottom half. So I don't even have to really do that. And my podcast with Karen, Karen's totally relaxed and she's in the, the oil and health field. Her people are not going to be upset if I'm not in the blazer. So I can just get dressed for me today. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the side that was done while I was brushing my teeth. What the expectation I need to do. And then and it was just the whole entire time I was getting ready, I was thinking about how I was going to connect with my kids, how I was going to connect with everyone that I needed to in this day, and how I was going to be amazing, and I was going to be loving and serving and giving. And every day, no matter what, I'm at least brushing my teeth and putting deodorant on and eye cream and moisturizer, because that's me. That's at least four minutes of mindset work. And since I did makeup, I, it was probably about 15 minutes of care I put into me today. I know, lots of time. <laughs> to some days where it's a half hour, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I Absolutely. More than 30 minutes to get ready. <clears throat> I just won't do it. So. <laughs> 30 minutes of power time. Mm -hmm. Of me getting me right. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so hot. <laughs> I keep interrupting you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it is hot it is hot and it's and it's a good time to share your hotness because i don't think there's enough opportunity that women focus on who they who they really are authentically they're really trying to get through who am i what's my purpose what's my passion what creates joy and instead inside all of us there's that pit in our stomach and that's the pit that speaks up when we're feeling sad. It's the pit that speaks up when we don't feel that we're enough. And we keep being told, especially by the beauty industry, that if you buy this and you buy that and you become this, that pit will go away. But that pit is our, our, is our little insecure inner self or whatever, um, you know, our natural man, whatever you want to call it, that's our humility check. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of different things you could call that. I like to call it the humility check. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And he who is poopy likes to make me think and amplify the negative of that voice. And he who is awesome wants to amplify the positive of that voice. So I have 
decided whenever it says anything poopy that I go, oh, I'm sorry, I flushed that down the toilet. <laughs> and when you see who was awesome, I'm like, tell me more how to expand that. Because all of us fear that we're not enough. And mm -hmm. all of us fear that we shouldn't be who we are and how we're showing up. Even me, hotness. You know, I mean, I'm called hotness and I walk in a room and I own it and I have insecurities and little things just like anyone else. But instead of giving them power, I put them in their proper place. Mm. Now, sometimes that little humility check is saying, Lita, you're talking too much. And then I can go, maybe I am. Mm. But if it's saying you're stupid, then I go, I'm sorry, you have a really grumpy bear voice right now and we are not going to listen to you. Well, and I think that's also one of the things that when you were writing this book, because we actually connected before, I think just about the time that the, the book was being released and my it was book or my second book. No, the first book. I think, okay. I think we're going to have to take another whole podcast on the second book because I didn't realize how much hotness really impacted I mean, it's cascaded just farther and farther, and it really is expanding much more than I anticipated. Because when I read the book, I was expecting one thing to be kind of like your message, you know, how I can be hot. And there's much more to it than that. Much Absolutely. more to it. It, it, if people always like, what's the one where you can encapsulate it into? And I say, well, confidence. And the other word that I would say would be prayer or meditation. And there's not one way you could say, oh, that's just, oh, simple. I mean, though, that is a very complex relationship, our relationship with ourself, our relationship with our God. That is a very complex and altering throughout where we are in our space and in our life. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, yeah. But it's completely integral to how we show up every day is how we show up in our life. Right? We've all heard that. But, and we've all heard, take the time to get your power hour. And I'm like, that is an amazing concept when you have toddlers that you could have a power hour. Well, and I think the other thing is when we talk about the relationship with ourself, we don't really talk about that as being a hot relationship. And the hotter that relationship is, the better, the more self-esteem you have, the more self-confidence you have. And that's really where the hotness kind of like escalates it Engaged. yeah sometimes i'm lukewarm with me and sometimes <laughs> i am just like sizzling hot <laughs> ball. yeah just like ah. and so one analogy i'd like to give about where hotness came from one anything in my world that is bad is referred to as poopy and anything that's amazing it's either awesome or hot and so um the, the word and it kind of started because when i was first doing a makeover with ladies and they would say, oh, we're going to have to leave extra time because I have really piggy eyes or something. And I'd be looking at them going, nope, you don't have piggy eyes. <laughs> nope. And like from a purely makeup standpoint, it would be women who would have like an insecurity about one part of their body that from a makeup standpoint, another part of their body might be more of the issue, but they had been told this was, so they were all fixated on this, you know? So mm -hmm. like, for example, I had been told that having brown hair was bad. Right? Where did that, where did that come I'm from? A bit racist, okay? And I'm a little bit something, something, just a little, little bit, right? But blondes were better. And so I was so fixated on how could I have different color hair? And you know what? My hair is one of my best features. I, I was just gonna say. Bit, <laughs> beautiful hair, right? That's just, I mean, I can throw it up and it still looks great. I mean, I really can't have bad hair. It's just no. amazing hair. And if I actually put time into it, it could be like model hair, right? <laughs> I, I didn't know that because I was so fixed on it and what I had been told from my culture, my society, meaning my family culture, yeah. of what was wrong with me. And my mother who has brown hair, when people would say, I look just like her, she'd say, don't worry, Lita, I've had a good life because guess who raised her? She too was told, but my grandmother should have thought of that before she married a part Native American man with brown hair, that that might filter through. And so she had this child that she could never give love and acceptance to fully as she could her blonde children. You know, so it's a very interesting oh. thing that I saw in beauty showing up time and time and time again with women. And so again, I would go into like these self ideas, but I realized that 
women were using beauty not only as this mask, but almost like a shame beating up on themselves thing instead of this, you know, just because they could, just because they wanted to get ready. And so I would, I would poke out my tummy to kind of like break the ice. And I'd be <laughs> like, but look how hot I am. You could be this hot. And I, I kind of hold me in a weird way so that I was not flattered anyway. And they'd kind of laugh and I, or I had a tooth that was missing. This was my favorite. And I'd pop the tooth back and I'd say, yes, let's focus on what's missing. These have all been fixed. So I don't you can't do it. Can't do it. I really kind of miss it. But they, it was just kind of a way of humor that I could kind of make them go, look at how you're th looking at this. You wouldn't look at me with that same kind of judgment. Yet you look at yourself with that kind of judgment. So hotness came from one, my jokes about what makes you hot. And then um, a wildfire burns out of control, right? It gets a lot of attention. And mm -hmm. so we can think of our latest celebrity that's in a hot mess, right? Um, gets lots of attention, but a campfire in contrast to a wildfire is actually hotter per molecule than a wildfire. Oh, wow. Because of the rocks that contain it and keep it within its proper boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, we all gather around campfires for one, if one, only one reason for s'mores, which involve chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, conversation, you know, if you look at how yeah. fire has been used throughout time, you know, safety, there's lots of good things, lots of good juicy analogies in that. Mm -hmm. And so instead of being what we are told by the beauty industry to be a wildfire, that our, our sexuality and our femininity is just everywhere and we can't control what men come to us. Oh yeah, we absolutely can. <laughs> right. You know, that is not a woman who is in control of her power mm -hmm. that she would let a man think he could just have her. Right. Right. And I'm talking about relationships, not rape. That's a totally different conversation. Right. So yeah, don't want yeah. anyone who yep. is like a man rapes her. That's not her fault. Even if she's walking down the street naked, different conversation. But you know that these women are like, I don't even know why he likes me. Probably because you flirted with him. It's very easy. If a man seems like he's interested in you to go, Oh, it's very easy for an empowered woman to set appropriate boundaries around herself with her network. But if you watch TV, it's supposed to be, we have no control over ourselves. We're just so sexual. Well, and I think that's one of the other things I wanted to bring up because there's, there are a few, I'll say singers, performers that have recently decided I'm not wearing makeup. And that's great. I, that's <laughs> fine. I think it's a great statement to say if that's what they want to do. But it's taken so long for someone to be, courageous enough to do that you know i um really hold props to jamie lee curtis she um posted um covered but nude okay she was doing nude but what i thought not that i'm like yay for her doing a nude photo shoot that she was pregnant but she would not allow them to photoshop her okay so she's in a place where most women feel insecure she was the first person from what I have been able to research, um, cause I don't know if this was like pre whatever, but you know, in this modern era that has chosen to be on a cover of a magazine and not allow herself to be photoshopped. And interesting about Jamie Lee Curtis's background is Jamie Lee Curtis was actually born in a, a condition that she does not have a uterus, but she had a female opening. Oh, and they, I didn't I know that. They that right now, but they literally could be considered both male or female. Okay. I didn't and know so that. She has a lot of reasons as a woman to feel insecure about her femininity. Okay. And yet she chose to be a groundbreaker. So I love that because I, I can't remember. Oh, it's irritating that I can't remember that word of what it's called, but you know, she could not give birth. So she has adopted mm. and she doesn't have all of her parts needed. Okay. But she would more be considered anatomically female. Okay. But she doesn't have all of the same hormones per se, right? Okay. So I'm just hoping that means she can recover quicker with better abs. That's, you know, that would be the hope, right? But okay. anyway, this is a woman that could feel like maybe she doesn't, isn't fully, you know, has insecure, insecurities like we all do. Right, right. And she said she has all the opportunity to only put her best face forward and said, no, you depict me as a real person as a real woman. So I, I really give props to that. And I think it's wonderful. 
for celebrities to be like, you know what, we're, we're ditching this idea of we have to be perfect because we have these magazines where they're like, look at the celebrities when they look like us. Right. Watch them take, you know, coming out of a store in a weird, you know, like weird pose. And they're like, oh, I can't believe how terrible they look. And then of course we Americans look at that and go, that's kind of what I look like at my nephew's wedding. Exactly. You know, and, oh, and embracing it, embracing yeah. that, you know, they really aren't any different. They may have had a career path that's different, but they're just like you and me. Um, I think one of the other things I wanted to touch upon, and I know we're, we're coming to a point um, in the interview where I really would like to let people know how to reach out to you because I think hotness is for everyone. Thank you. I do too. Isn't that funny that we both agree on that? No, I, I put a lot of time into writing this book. And um, at the time, I thought it would be the book that I wrote. And since then, um, I, you know, I am an owl legit author. I have another book and I've got three in the works. So, you know, more books will be coming. But um, <laughs> I'm very proud of the message of femininity and strength that I gave. And it's not it's from all of my years of walking women through their insecurities and walking my own self through those and to getting to a place where where I was right now was worthy of being called hotness. And every woman where she is right now just implements these tools into her life. She will see herself differently. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that is one of the things that I think we would like to, I'm going to be posting your website. So if women want to get in touch with you, they have that opportunity. I have if resources on my website too. Of okay. Love and help and all that kind of stuff. So. Okay. And then the other thing is I want to say that I think we're going to be setting up another podcast for us so that you can talk about love me too, because I think that deserves its own time. And we're going to be going through the, the evolution of Lita on her journey, because I know you've got so much to share with us. And I think women need to take you in bite-sized pieces so that they can go through the journey with you, but that they also can reconnect with their authentic self as you do starting the journey for us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. I'd love to be on again. And I do want people to know that, you know, when we get caught up in comparison and even like talking about the celebrity thing, we put those celebrities up on a pedestal. And this, I wish were my quote that I would have said, but whenever we put people on a pedestal, we diminish connection. Absolutely. And I love that so much because it makes me sad when people treat me like I'm not a normal person, like I'm above them. Cause I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm a normal person. I'm come on, let's connect. But they get so caught up in the, the celebrity or impressiveness or pedestal thing. And I imagine that a lot of celebrities are very lonely. And I, if we do that to yes. our celebrities, I think we also do it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. That we hold ourselves up to a certain standard and we feel like we fall short of that because we feel like we should be on this pedestal. And when we fall short of that because we are human, we allow ourselves, we disallow ourselves from having our own self love. And I think that's part of the reason that you and I connected, Alita, because it was heart to heart authentic to authentic person. And that's really how you break free and thrive in being courageous by authentically connecting with women. And connecting, and it starts with you and I were able to do that so flawlessly yes. from the first connection because you and I have done that self work. And the yes. work that you and I do in a really our own, in our own different modalities is we're saying, be kind to you. And all power is within us. It's just willing if we're willing to let it pull us and it will come. All the good things come in your life when you're just, when you're good to you, it just flows out of you and good and success and all those things just, blah, 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 just it's like they can't help themselves. You know, if you want to call it manifesting or spirituality, you know, I believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's my modality, but they all teach the same thing. Every single religion that has ever been teaches that there's a redeeming path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are all going to make mistakes. We are all going to screw up. And that is part of being human. So mm -hmm. why would you beat up on yourself and shame yourself and castigate yourself thinking you can't have all the good things in life when all you have to do is take out the shame, which has a low resonance. 
Yes. Right? And that's yes. A, whole, a whole conversation right there, mm -hmm. right? It's a low vibration. It's, it's poopy and it's allowing he who is poopy into your thought process. Why would we do that? No, 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 no. Start, no, no. <laughs> start your day with, ha, ha, I'm going to be amazing, right? <laughs> Move on, and you're like, yeah, I got this. And the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to think you're more awesome. There you go. Yeah, and your husband likes awesome people. That's why he married you. <laughs> and your children need to be role models. What awesome <laughs> looks like. And deprecating ourselves does not embrace our awesome. It actually pushes our husband and children away. And everyone else knows that vibration too. When you're up here, everyone else is just vibrationally attracted to you because of your awesomeness yeah and that being said yesterday i had sad happen and it was sad enough that i had a lot of different emotions and so i said to myself okay i'm taking the rest of the day off and i'm going to walk through all of these emotions and then tomorrow i'm going to wake up and i'm going to be awesome <laughs> and I, because i gave myself the time to deal and process what had happened. Yeah. And so I don't want anyone hearing this to go, oh, I have to wake up awesome every day. You know, some days are hard. Mm -hmm. But you put a time limit on it. And then if it's not enough, then you set up another time for it. Right? Mm -hmm. And you can, you can compartmentalize and you can show up more awesome than not. But if you just say, I'm not allowed to have this feeling, I shouldn't be feeling this way. It's not okay. I'm better than this. That's called shame. Yeah. And we do not give power to that. We walk ourselves through it and allow it and then say, okay, I'm releasing it. Well, thank you so much, Lita, for sharing your hotness with us and showing us how to be awesome. And I look forward to reconnecting with you. Thank you so much. You will. Thank you so much for having me on, Karen. Okay.